Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. It's a little bit later than usual this Friday, but there you go. We do have a podcast for you. I'm not going to do too much waffling at the start of this one. Just going to get straight into what I think is a very interesting conversation in which myself and Clive, uh, Clive Palmer, we discuss the squad and the transfer window. Uh, in very broad strokes, but obviously getting into some specifics when it comes to certain players. But what do we need or not need uh, in all the various areas of the pitch? Goalkeeper, defence, midfield, attack. We go through that, but we start by talking about Willian, a player who uh, signed this morning on a three-year contract from Chelsea. Well, from Chelsea is a free transfer. His contract expired uh, at Chelsea, and he joins us at 32 years of age on a three-year deal, something which I think is a bit of a concern. Concern, but um, you would hope the club have done their due diligence uh, in terms of his um, his physical ability and all the various medical tests and everything else. And I realise, of course, that given some of the scenarios we currently face and have faced in the past, people might question the wisdom of doing that kind of thing. But it didn't feel like the right time to have that conversation. So we talk a bit more about what Willie Ann might bring to the team as a player uh, and everything else. And, of course, get into that whole discussion about squad building, who might come, who might go. No hugely specific but the various areas of the pitch and everything else so look let's get into it and uh, as i said with me to discuss all that and more it's clive palmer hi clive hello hello. let's start with the news that has dropped this morning unexpected completely out of the blue arsenal have made a signing willian never heard of him uh no i'm joking Uh, we have announced finally the uh the signing of of willian on a free transfer from chelsea um it doesn't say, oh, he signed a three-year deal. It does say exactly how. So that's a good deal for Willian. Um, we'll wait and see if it turns out to be a good deal for Arsenal. But Mikel Arteta says, uh, we've been monitoring uh, him for the last few months. We had a clear intention to strengthen in the attacking midfielder and winger positions. And he is a player that gives us a lot of versatility. He can play in three or four different positions. Then he talks about his experience and how impressed he's been with the talks he's had. But that's an interesting part of 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 uh, this signing I think um you know whatever reservations you might have about giving a 32 year old a three year deal and I think those are reasonable if you are limited in terms of what you can spend in the transfer market bringing in a player who in your mind can play in three or four different positions seems like a good way of adding some depth yeah absolutely I think when we've taken Oh, Angie, I can hear myself coming back. Oh, yeah. Sorry, mate. All right, hang on. I can pretend I asked you that question. Blah, blah, blah. Versatility, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, if you look at William, he sort of fixes a few problems for us, doesn't he? I mean, I, keep, I can't get the Aston Villa game out of my mind, actually, when we were lacking creativity. When teams drop in, what do we do then? Because we're sort of become a natural sort of counter-attacking team or a through-the-pitch team playing out from the back. So when teams sit in, which they will do as we improve, he then has to find solutions to play against a a 5-4-1 deep block. And Mm. Willian, being in a team that's been in charge of the football for many years, he's very, very good in small spaces. He's got an unbelievable shift and shoot from left to right, and he does it really well. I think he's... Maybe been not say misused at Chelsea, but he's made it work on the right hand side when I think he preferred to play in the middle or the left and he chose the right last. But he makes all three positions work and that type of player fixes from a footballistically point of view, fixes an issue. But then you look at the age, look at the salary, and then we get the normal noise about the validity and the efficiency of this deal. And um, so that really is the thing that people may discuss. But as a football player, this is not one of the Chelsea ones they really wanted to let go. This was one they wanted to keep. And so I'm excited about that. I'm excited about his quality. And I'm excited about the fact he's a known quantity to the league. And I think he'll benefit us. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly no question of settling in. And he had a very good season last season with Chelsea. I think overall he sort of averages... Uh, over the course of his time at Chelsea, around five goals a season and uh, just over five goals a season, just under five assists. So, you know, it's not magic numbers, but certainly in terms of a player who can come in and do a job and add something to a team, which I think we can all see is in need of, uh, you know, a a boost in uh, quality and also experience. He ticks those boxes. I I don't, on the day that we sign him, want to go down the road of, of, you know, 
how the deal came about and the various connections there. We are going to talk a little bit about that now in, in a second anyway. But I think, you know, like any player who signs, he deserves uh, the chance to show what he can do on the pitch. The wisdom and uh, the the decision to give him a deal of that length at 32 um, we can see in, in time as to how smart that was. I mean, I have concerns, and I'm sure you do, and I'm sure many of the people listening to this would have concerns about giving any 32-year-old a three-year deal because we've been down this road before with, with players that we find then hard to move on. But let's leave that for the time being. Um, does it suggest to you, Clive, a shift in the way that Mikel Arteta is going to set up his team next season? Is he thinking now about an extra man in midfield um, and probably reverting to a back four? Um, because when you bring in Willian, if you're going to play him centrally, it, it it suggests that you're going to be using a midfield three at least. Potentially. I think sometimes people show you who they are by the first thing that they do. So when Arteta came in, he, he flipped straight to a 4 2 3 one and he did the old Shaka thing to left-hand side, putting it left back, and we built up in like a 2-3-5 or 3-2-5, and it looked really good. And then we came back from lockdown, and he went straight back to a 4-2-3-1. And then suddenly we had the injuries, and he went to a back three. Mm. And so is he really telling us who he is by the first thing that he does? So I think maybe potentially he might go back to a 4 2 3 one using a player behind a striker and two people from the side. Now, in our minds, because he's come from Man City, we know what he's done there, we know what he's been behind there. We have this thought process, he might play a 4-3-3. Yeah. But what what I do see, is I do see a number of players that can do a number of things, and, and what's been quite unique about Arteta is how he's changed systems within games and depending on the temperature of a game. So if we have to back three, for example, if we're on top, we push people up, we go to a back four really simply, and we use Maitland-Niles or Saka to disappear into midfield or high up on left-hand side. And we use a clever player like Tierney inside and outside. And more of these players that can do more than one job and more in different zones of the pitch, I think is going to really benefit this coach. I think he's very smart, giving people a number of game scenarios that we can flip to seamlessly. So when I see a signing like this, I just I get quite excited tactically because mm. we can really do a lot of things. You know, players that are very one dimensional, that have one layer, they sort of fix you into certain roles. They can only do one thing. And if that one thing isn't happening on that day, if the story of the game does not suit their skill set, then what happens? Yeah. You know, so yeah. we need more of these players that can play in different game shapes and different scenarios. And I think it's going to be exciting to see what he does. Being midfield, I hope so, but yeah. let's see. Uh, I don't know if you saw the quotes that came out last night. Uh, Emmy Martinez was talking to Marca, uh, and he was talking about you know his future and how he wants to play again. That's something that uh, we can all understand. He was talking about how there uh, I'm in the crosshairs of ten teams in Europe. You know, a little shot there to make sure that Arsenal recognise the fact that he's a wanted man after what he's done, and, and fair play to him for that. But uh, he said uh, of Mikel Arteta, and just going back to you know when you're talking about. Um, the way the coach might use different um, scenarios or different tactical uh, setups in different games or even switching within games. He says, Arteta is a great coach. He changed the structure of Arsenal. He gave us a game plan. Um, He then went on to say, in training, we see he has a clear idea of the game. He surprises us every day. Like, you know, Emi Martinez is 27 years old. He's worked with Arsene Wenger. He's worked with Unai Emery. He's worked with countless coaches in the various loan moves and loan spells that he's had at different clubs. So, you know, he's, uh, despite not playing that much, a very experienced guy, you know, having come to England at 17, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I suppose there is an element in which he's talking up the manager, you know, in the press publicly and doing it, you know, because that's what you do. You're not you're not going to uh, start slagging him off or anything like that. But it, it, it seems sort of genuine what he's saying about, you know, when, talk, when he talks about he's changed the structure, he's given us a game plan. That's quite a yeah. thing for, a, for a, a player to say. Yeah, players are notorious judges of coaches and managers, aren't they? The moment they're happy and something's really going well, they get quite excited about it. And we have, just because they're elite athletes, elite footballers, they still like to learn something. 
Like they know if they've got a coach that can teach them things and protect them and put them into areas of the pitch where they're really going to be comfortable. If they meet a coach that really understands their strengths and weaknesses and how to promote their strengths mm. and how to develop those strengths in training and how to cover those weaknesses in training and how to put a game plan that suits more people than it doesn't, they love that. Mm. They absolutely love that because their careers are looked after. So when they see that, when they feel that, when they smell that, they really want to talk about it. I always say the same thing. Football's a village, so people chat. I mean, before Arteta even came to our sort of eye line the first time around, before Emery, the feedback was so positive. I'm thinking, why is this happening? You know, why? how do so many people say so many positive things about him? Mm. And then it obviously we had Emery, then it didn't quite work out towards the end. And then again, the chat started from the people who are really well-respected coaches and managers, everybody saying positive things. Obviously, the village of football has spoken. The players at Man City had spoken about his influence. The, the, the trophies on the on the side shelf were obviously evidence of yeah. what Man City were doing, but there's reasons for that outside of Arteta's coaching ability. But that's still a positive sign, and he's coming to us. And I must admit, from day one, he's made me think, differently um not just on the coaching side but on the communication leadership yeah i feel as though there's a plan there with him you you feel that don't you you feel as though there's a plan and when you look at the club from the outside we're used to having somebody we trust you know historically in wenger and now we've got somebody else that we can hold on to and i think we trust him and now it's all about how we support him and how we develop as a club around him. Mm. Well, look, what I wanted to do in this particular podcast was just sort of go through the various areas of the pitch um, and the squad as we look um, to address some of the issues that we have and have seen. And, and clearly the, the signing of Willian goes some way to doing that in, in the top end of the pitch. But we'll come to that in the end. Uh, just while we're on, Emmy Martinez, we, we have two very good goalkeepers. Um, do you view it as any kind of a problem for Mikel Arteta, the fact that Emi Martinez has come through and performed so well. I mean, if the season were ongoing and, you know, let's say the Leno injury happened in September and, and Martinez came in to deputize, it would be very difficult for Martinez to lose his place based on what he's done. So I'm really curious as to see who is going to start the season as, as Arsenal's number one goalkeeper. Eventually, something's got to give. Um, but right now, it feels to me like a real positive that we have these two guys, basically the same age. Yeah. Um, their, their, their experiences, their career trajectories have been very, very different. Leno started at a much younger age and became a number one at a much younger age. Whether that um, means that Emmy is more uh, focused, more driven, more motivated, having finally got his chance, we'll, we'll wait and see. But it doesn't seem like he's short of, of options or offers if, if um, one is made to him. But um, this, this doesn't feel like an area this summer uh, when the transfer window is open that we have to really worry about or spend any time thinking about. No, uh, you can't. If you're Martinez, what more can you do? You've come in and not only have you played well, I think he's connected really well to his back four and his other te- and, and his t- team. I think he looks really confident. You know, we've seen him. He's not new to us. We've seen him many times. And I never felt he made enough saves, Andrew, to be honest. I just <laughs> felt the ball kept going in the net. He looked he looked like he was the right type. He could kick the ball. He could redistribute. He has the right size, you know. So why is the ball going in? <laughs> That's what I used to think. Yeah. So I dismissed him. And then, um, but now his confidence has just gone through the roof and he just looks almost unbeatable. He's got one little issue on one on ones. We go down a bit early, but you know, that can be fixed really quickly and he just looks tremendous. So we've got a decision to make. There's chat about Leno's maybe his knee injury, which looked horrific the first time we saw it. May not have been diagnosed correctly and he may not be coming back as quickly as was originally suggested. So. Potentially, Martinez could start the, the, the season. And if he does, we're going to hit the, the January, the winter window. Mm. Maybe we've got a decision to make. And um, Martinez is on quite a low way, so I also need to get him to sign something quickly or they need to make a decision. And one of them is going to go eventually in the next calendar year, I'm afraid, because that's the way sport is. You can't have a keeper that's worth north of maybe £30 million pounds sitting on your bench too long. Yeah, you know, and there are options out there that we can go for, and we can obviously use that money as part of the rebuild. Yeah, well, that's true. Martinez has got two years left on his current deal, so there is an element, isn't there, in which Arsenal have to 
maybe make some kind of decision about what they want to do with him, whether they, you know, they're going to put their eggs in his basket or Leno's basket, whatever it might be. But look, I think it's the best kind of problem that you can have. Uh, which of these good players will I use or will I keep, you know, rather than, holy shit, how how are we going to cope with this guy in goal, you know, where we've, yeah. we've yeah. been a little bit before. So... Let's move to the defense, and I think the center of the defense is is going to be an interesting area. We have a lot of players, a lot of numbers, a lot of bodies, but maybe not quite enough quality. And one of the things that occurs to me is that if we are going to move to a back four, we we have issues with some of the defenders that we have. The, the strong end to the season that David Luiz had... Um, and he deserves credit for that in as much as it's hard to uh, give him any credit for the, the number of penalties he conceded. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a trade-off, a balancing act with him. We know that. But, but certainly playing in a back three really, really suits David Luiz. Playing in a back four, not so much. And I think that's been a, uh, the case throughout his career, not simply at Arsenal. So... Um, we do have Pablo Marie, but we're unsure of quite what he is yet uh, because we haven't seen anywhere near enough of him and he's had that injury, so that's a bit disappointing. Um, we have William Saliba, of course, but the the other guy, Socrates Mustafi, Chambers holding, been there, done that, and I know I've heard you talk about this before, um, about holding on to players too long that we're kind of, we're desperate to give them the chance to become what we want them to become. And in doing so, we kind of put a bit too much time in players who aren't quite ever going to be what we want them to be. It feels like maybe with a couple of the young guys, uh, I think in Chambers and Holding, um, that might be a scenario we have to deal with in this window. I think so. I mean, the way I look at it always, it's a bit hard sometimes, but I look around at the teams that we want to beat. You know, I look around at Liverpool, I look around at Manchester United in particular. I look at the forwards that they have. And then I put Chambers and Holding, for example, in the middle of our defence in a back four. And I just try to imagine them trying to stop Rashford, you know, Greenwood, Mane, Salah, in a sprinting race running backwards in a back four. And when I see that, I think, mm, I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure they've got what it takes. We can hide them in a the back three on occasion, one of them, but in a back four, no chance. You need the ability to run into white spaces. You're left sometimes on your own as a two. So you're left one-on-one. -on -one. Can you win those battles? I'm just never been convinced. There was a game start of the season many years ago, about three, four, maybe five years ago, when I think it's Mane one of his first games when Liverpool came to the Emirates and they beat us handily. Mm. And Mane went down the right wing, he he boshed off Chambers and he boshed off Holding. Yeah. And just ran in and scored. I mean, it was like playground at school stuff. And I remember thinking to myself right then, we've got a problem because we can't stop him. And from that moment on, we need to ask ourselves the question, are these the right players for us? We sent Chambers out. He went out on loan a couple of times to Middlesbrough and he went to Fulham. Fulham did not play him in the back four. They moved him into centre midfield in that Eric Dyer type role. They didn't trust him back then. He had a fantastic season. So that's telling you who he is. I think he's got more rounded football than holding. But they, for me, they both need to go and make their careers. They really do need to go somewhere where they're loved, mm. make their careers, play football. Play football for a team that understands who you are, the pressure slightly less, and develop your career as a first team footballer. I think it's important we allow them to do that. Okay, so are you expecting a central defender to arrive? I am. Yeah? I am. And I, I, I am a bit of a fan of Pablo Marie. I, I like him. I like what he's... I know it's only a small sample, but I like the, the moments I've seen. I like the fact we give him the ball. I like the fact that he's got control in there. He knows what he is and what he isn't. Mm. He knows he's not quick, so he presses up really tight. When he's exposed and someone's on the ball with no pressure, he drops off early. He's a very smart player. Um, also, uh, we all wish he was a step faster, but he understands what he, he's not that quick and he plays accordingly. So yeah. I think he's a better player there than people realise, but let's see what happens. Um, so, obviously, Saliba looks like amazing. He looks like a giant. Uh, he, he just looks incredible. So, that's, that's the type of defender that you want to buy on the physical profile and how he plays. He's very much an engaging centre-back. He goes into contact. He's a front-footed player that he drives out of his hole into the other player, into mm. the other team's half. So, behind him, I think we need a covering player. 
right? So, and this is why I quite like the Brazilian player, Gabriel, because he's a lefty, he's very fast, and he naturally wants to cover. So the potential of that is quite significant. But again, it's a bit of waste, Andrew, because we've already got a left-footed centre-half. So mm. what do we do? Buy another one? You know, so, um, yeah, I mean, that is the weird thing, isn't it? Like, nobody ever questions the idea of a right-footed player playing on the left-hand side uh, of a back four. Um, nobody ever has any issue with that. I mean, it's where I played my entire life. Uh, but you never ever, or very rarely, see a left-footed defender playing on the right-hand side of a back four. Heaven. I wonder about it because Man City have got a couple lefties, don't they? Nathan Aki and Laporte. What are they going to do with them? Mm. Uh, my feeling maybe they play Aki as a, a left back nominally, and then they they defended a back three. Is it everyone's saying we're going to move away from a back three? But you know, I watched RB Leipzig last you know, yesterday, and they had a back three. You know, Dortmund play with a back three. There are teams moving to this, and it's, mm. it's becoming more in vogue. And I'm not against it. It's for me, it's all about your creative balance. Yeah. And your wing back balance, you know, if you have two full backs who head and kick it in as wing backs, you're really playing five defenders. But if you put a winger out there on one side, somebody's really inventive with on the ball going forward, you had the creativity there. So it's it's yeah. not the system, it's how you play it. And I think, you know, I'm not against the back three. I hope it's not fully dead. Yeah, no, no. I mean, uh, Lewis Ambrose, who writes the tactics column for, for the site, made a great point on a podcast a couple of weeks ago that Dortmund have scored a record number of goals this season using a back three. So a lot of it is about personnel. It can be really defensive, but, you know, Barcelona playing a 3-4-3, has anybody ever said that's defensive? You know, no. so it's it's about. This is a smart man. I always agree with him. <laughs> so yeah, he's he's dead right. And yeah, we've we've had our best part of the season with back three. Let's be honest. Yeah, there, there's been occasions we've worried about creativity, but um, you know that's because we really ask the Bamyang to be a creator and a scorer, and he's really a scorer. Mm. If you put somebody else on his side and put him up down the middle, suddenly you got creativity in in the two players behind him, in Pepe and William, for example. Mm. And if you can progress the ball in a in a consistent way of a bit of agility, then you start to think, mm, this looks quite good. Mm. You know, so I'm not against it. I just think the creativity angle is the key one. And I think we've maybe fixed a little bit with that with William and, and I hope there's more to come. All right. Right back. I mean, we have cover now in that position. We've got um, Hector Bellerin. We've got Cedric Suarez. We do have Ainsley Maitland-Niles for the time being who can play there and who can also play uh, in the left back position. Um, I'm, I'd be surprised if anything happened there, inward or outward. Yeah, I think we might lose one. We might lose one of the. We might lose of one the of three. the three. I mean, of the, well, it's really the two, isn't it? We we, we presume that Cedric's going to stay, but Bellerin or Maitland Niles. I mean, it looks like Maitland Niles. Yeah. I just think we're going to lose one. I, I, I mean, don't know why, but maybe I just just a feeling. I mean, if it were. If you had to pick one, and going back maybe to what we said about um, Willian at the start, where we talked about Arteta's desire for versatility within his squad, uh, Hector, a player I really like, but he's a right back or a right wing back, and and that's it. Maitland Niles has a bit of a higher ceiling, if you like, in terms of what he can bring to the squad in terms of versatility because he can play in both fullback positions, in both wingback positions. He's played in the front three. Um, he's also, you know, somebody who people talk about as a an option in central midfield, even though he's very, very rarely featured for us there. But, but in terms of his profile and his skill set, he could provide a lot more depth than Hector. And Hector could, yeah. whether people want to hear this or not, uh, because he's a very popular guy. And like I said, I, I really like him. He is somebody who could generate funds, which could be invested elsewhere. It's a, it's a bit of pill because we've all grown up with Hector and we know what he thinks about the club and how he is as a human being. But from football-wise, you're absolutely right. Um, Maynard Niles is a player, well, we've, just, we've all seen him recently in the biggest games against the biggest teams, and he delivers. He has elite speed, elite recovery. Yes, he lacks a little bit of focus on occasion with the last pass, but you can see this player being used in a, in a flex, with a flexible coach and a flexible system. I think he, he does a lot of things really well. So I am a fan. I've got a slight bias there, you know, as I'm yeah. sure you're aware. 
if anything, I'm happy with Hector and and Maitland Niles. And if we're buying, it's a Cedric deal. I sort of question that a little bit. Um, I know he can play left back as well. So if that allows um, Kieran Tierney to have some time off, and from a squad perspective, that allows Saka to play in areas sure. that he wants to play and not left back. I think okay, from a squad wise, a full back can play two sides. A bit of a James Milner type thing as a cover player at full back. I could just about wear it. I'm not sure he should be paid the money he's being paid, but there you go. And um, so, yeah, I could just about wear it, but I hope Maitland Niles stays. He's just made that step forward in in belief, and he looks as though he's got the trust of his teammates and the trust within the fan group has increased because of what he's done recently. This is the time to stay for me, but sometimes people use this as a, a step forward and mm. maybe just say, I want to go somewhere else and really be somebody. So... Let's see what happens around you. We know he's changed his agent, and this agent is not a quiet little flower. So no. let's see what happens. He will make sure his players well positioned. So sure. AMC can't do anything more than what he's done from the football side of things, and now he just needs to continue it. Yep, that's true. Uh, left back, I mean, Tierney, uh, I, I don't know how anybody couldn't love Kieran Tierney because of the way he plays, what he brings to the team in terms of his quality, but also his character. And, and uh, you know, hopefully he's a, a guy who's going to be in situ for a long time. Um, Saka, where he's going to end up, I think, is is one of the interesting aspects of this season. Um, if we manage to find a new home for, say, Kalasinac, would you be concerned that without a direct replacement at left back, we might leave ourselves short? Or would you have confidence that as and when Saka... Uh, is needed he could play there I suppose the issue is uh, of course that Tierney is uh, if we use a back three very often playing on the left hand side of that which isn't where Saka could play yeah so obviously there's players to come back in so if Mary's back fit and he's meant to be back by September that back three situation left hand side changes a little bit um You've also got Cedric can flip over. You've got Maitland Niles, if he stays, please. He can flip over. And I think it's important that we develop Saka in forward areas, either as a left sider or in a 4 3 as a left number eight. I definitely like to see him there. Or potentially he could be he could literally be a number ten, you know, to be the player that mm. that really underpins Willian, for example. And there's maybe two players that could do that role in Smith Rowe as well. And I, I just want to see these young players have the right type of mentors or the right type of experience to show them what the road, but let's not be overly dependent upon them. I've often felt in the past we've overburdened our young players. Yeah. We we overburdened Jack Wilshire. We overburdened Seth Ses. Yes, we enjoy it when it happens, but eventually we burn them or we break them. And I don't think it's right. You know, I don't think it's right. It's exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm one for being overly excited for the young players. As soon as I see them, I love them straight away. You know, don't care. But then you think back, you think, have we managed their careers properly? And I see a difference with this regime. They really are thinking carefully about that mm. and thinking carefully about what they do with them. And I want to see that continue. Midfield. Midfield, midfield, midfield. This is the <laughs> yeah. this is the area I think which has long been a bugbear for many Arsenal fans. We've been looking for something. We've been looking for the player or the players or the system or whatever it might be to give us the kind of control that um, can benefit the team going forward and also benefit the team from a defensive point of view because it does feel like a lot of our defensive issues come because, you know, we, we just don't control football matches the way we used to and the way we've uh, become accustomed to or certainly were accustomed to under Arsene Wenger even when things weren't going as well as they were. We were a, a high-possession team. We were a team that had a lot of the ball and that has been lost or sacrificed or whatever way you want to put it um, over the last number of years. Torreira, there are question marks over whether he's going to be here or not. Genduzzi, it seems almost inevitable that he is going to go. Danny Ceballos, uh, he is a player who we don't quite know if we're going to be able to get back uh, from Real Madrid. They're sort of posturing a little bit in terms of what they want to do with him next season, probably in order to to force Arsenal's hand uh, to, to make an offer. Um, we have Joe Willock, we have Granit Xhaka, um, and Willian, of course, has come in and he will uh, he will add something from a central point of view if that's where Mikel Arteta wants to, to play him. 
Um, but it feels like, to me anyway, this is the area of the pitch which is key in how we judge the business we do this summer and how effective it is in terms of giving Mikel Arteta the tools that he needs to get the team playing the way he wants them to play. Yeah, and I think I've got, I have theories on this, Andrew. Oh, I yeah. <laughs> I have theories on midfield. I, I, I think football's developing in a, in a different way where we grew up with what I call box-to-box midfielders. You, you traverse midfield. Yeah. You know, you, you wanted players there that's made big strides that can carry the ball right the way through or run the, the ball through, like an Aaron Ramsey, for example. I think those midfielders are becoming less of the vogue. And the reason, you, you tend to have midfielders that are play at the base of the team and they have a certain skill skill set mm. they can take the ball in the half turn they can beat the press because everyone's trying to press you off the ball now because the best way to create is to create from people's mistakes yeah so if people at the base on the field that can receive the ball with the satellite dish on on the half turn and can progress the ball up the pitch or into wide areas the reason why we go into wide areas because you lose it centrally you're there for the transition and you normally concede so coach has been data driven these days they look at the high risk areas where you lose the ball they're prepared to suck you in when they have an, a numerical advantage when you've got defenders there in wide spaces like we did against man city with the 18 pass goal they'll take a risk there but once you break through you need to progress quickly into wide areas that's what we're doing really quite well that means your midfielders your attacking midfielders are really a, a bunch of wingers that drop in so you you start high, you you play the game of almost territory, and you try to fill your five lanes. Mm. You start high, and you roll into midfield. So you position yourself high, you keep people back, and then as you're progressing, you roll off those defenders into midfield. You refill the midfield from a high area, and then you go to the next phase. And so that's why you're seeing Arsenal linked to a lot of sort of wing forwards. So one of our create, most creative midfielders, in a strange way, is Pepe. Mm. No, he gets in, he gets in, he comes, starts high, but he rolls into those Urzel zones and he creates. William does the same. Mount did the same. Pulisic did the same. These are the players. Sterling does this. They're attacking midfielders, wing forward scorers. They're the jewels of the game right now. So if your base midfielders like your Shackers and your parties and players like that, it's a bias to a point, players that receive it and they, and they drive the car from a deep midfield position, but then you have your attacking wing forwards that drop into midfield that create. So your creativity is there at that end. So that that box to box player is too high risk. They empty and they, they can get trapped on the ball. Yeah. And so you you don't really see that too many times. So I just think the game is changing, so the qualities are changing. The deep midfield is the one that's gonna have range of paths, they've got to have the distance, they've got to have the fizz through the line to get through the five lanes. I think we need to invest in maybe one or two more in the base and one, maybe one more in the higher end of the pitch that can roll in and be more creative. And I think that's what I see us doing going forward. All right. Um, It is going to be fascinating. I mean, creativity is something Arteta talked about and Willian will provide an element of that. Um, uh, On Saka, I know we talked about him when we talked about left back and wing back, but there were a couple of games where he was played on on the right hand side, but also one or two where he played in in midfield. Um, when you talk about the, the, the attributes that a modern midfielder needs, he's certainly got plenty of those. Um, he doesn't seem like a guy who is unready for the responsibility of playing in that area of the pitch if we chose to use him in there. Yeah, I love how he plays. He he can play in small spaces, but he can run into big spaces. So he receives it and he pops it and he goes again. And when he comes back to him at full speed, he's soft first touch. He's crossing this superb. I mean, it's De Bruyne like De Bruyne like with his left foot. He sweeps the ball into those danger areas so accurately. I mean, he hardly ever plays a bad cross. You know, he just hardly ever does. Mm. So he's a sort of he's the classic new wing fielder, inside and out, and he is the modern player. And it's no surprise he's got that squad number. He is a jewel. We've really got to protect him. He can just do a lot. He can shoot off both feet. He can travel with the ball. He's played left back in the back four. He's played left wing back. He's played left eight. He's played right side in the front three. Um, you know, there's rumours of him killing it in training as a number ten. This guy is exceptional, exceptional from a footballing perspective. He's got a wonderful manner, calm on the pitch, well-loved by his teammates. Mm. 
I'm getting overexcited again about youth players, <laughs> but I think, you know, when I look at this guy, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, please, please, let's look after him. You know, he can score. He's got the lot, Andrew. He's got the lot. He's the modern, modern player that Arteta would no doubt want to build his team around in time. So I think the Willian signing um, is going to, it's almost like a, a protective state for him to keep the pressure off but, and allow him to develop in a nice, calm way. Yeah, OK. Well, yeah, he's, he's going to be somebody who everybody keeps a close eye on because of... Uh, you know what a what a great season he had at 18 years of age. Um, it, it petered out a little bit towards the end, obviously, and maybe there was more to it than we know. Uh, perhaps an injury keeping him out of the the final games of the season, but uh, a really exciting talent up top. Dare we make the assumption that Pierre Emerick Aubameyang is staying? I hope so. Otherwise, um, <laughs> there'd be a lot of people crying themselves to sleep if it doesn't happen. I, to me, it feels like he's um, an Arsenal player to me. Everything you read and see. And and I think he brings a lovely mood to the club. And he delivers, isn't he? He scored more goals than anybody yeah. since he signed. So when it comes down to it, we need those goals to help us develop. Yeah. So, Pepe, what are you expecting from him next season? Because people have drawn parallels uh, with, with Robert Pires first season in England, which was... I think widely considered to be a little bit disappointing, which I think is slightly unfair because he did score, he ended up scoring 10 goals or 11 goals. And Pepe in his first season, you know, there's no, um, uh, what, what was I going to say there? I've completely forgotten what I was going to say. I mean, he's, he ended up with eight assists or eight, nine goals, eight assists, something yeah. like that. Anyway, you know, he looks quite good. He looks yeah, quite good. you know, maybe not quite the 72 million pound player yet. Um, but... It feels like a relatively decent grounding um, and a, an experience from which, you know, if he's minded to do it, he can really learn from because he's, you know, I don't want to say he's been through a lot because it sounds very dramatic, but, you know, he came uh, with a big fee, he came to a new country, new language, new club, um, new team. Things were not right within that team, it's fair to say, uh, under Emery, and it's taken Mikel Arteta some time to get things, you know, slightly back on track. But maybe going through those things gives you a bit of, I don't know, hardens you up a bit and, and makes you ready for what's what's to come in your second season. Yeah, I, I think it's difficult to talk about Pepe without talking about the price. Yeah. And I think if that player was 45 million, we would just be thinking we've got something here we can't wait to get started but that price puts almost like an accelerated development on us on it and on him really we we expect him to deliver much earlier much sooner we don't want to be embarrassed as fans we don't want to justify him to other sets of fans and when we see things like the big flop and the waste of money we naturally want to defend that mm. you know and um but when we well, we watch him every week obviously in every minute of every week and we can all see there's something there. And in the last few months, he's really improved defensively. And, and going forward, he has, an, he has an incredible technique of striking the ball on that left foot. Yeah, He's so accurate. He's always got people on their heels. He is a, a real talent that we can just start to see. He's starting to really dominate games. You could easily say he was man of the match in the cup final. Easily say. And many people have that opinion. And, and I just think, you know, if he scored that goal was allowed, that could have been a, a real lift off for him. Yeah. You know? So, um, so yeah, I think he has really, really started to bubble under. There's not a huge preseason this year. <laughs> Obviously, we've been starting again a couple of weeks. Yeah. So there isn't that that's that situation where it's almost like there's a second season starting, there's a big gap. He's going to come back in with renewed confidence, and there'll be a renewed expectation on him. And I think he's ready to handle it. And I and I see a potential star of the league in that player. Yeah, I just hope I hope it happens. Just before we move on from Pepe, I think it's worth referencing a story which has come out this morning on ESPN by James Olley, who who people will know, of course, used to work for the Evening Standard, a long time Arsenal correspondent, and there is apparently an internal investigation being uh, undertaken into. Uh, the Pepe transfer, the £72 million pounds that we paid. Um, we paid £20 million up front, reportedly, and we've committed to another £52 million over the next five years, which is kind of eye-watering when you lay it out like that. Um, you know, there's talk of um, numbers being looked at. There's talk of some of the, um, how would you say this, 
properly. Maybe some of the people who were involved in the deal that didn't necessarily have to be involved in the deal and, and the way that the deal was structured has long been uh, a cause of conversation, it might be said, behind the scenes. So just your brief thoughts on on that story from, from James um, and what it might mean um, for the club. Yeah, I think, Andrew, what's happening here is... W- it's almost like there's a couple of cultures going on here. In the old days, Arsene Wenger would run away from these types of deals where there potentially was a few people in the background getting payments that are not aligned as they should be. And we've seen him walk away from many deals. And remember, remember the Kante deal? Mm. They, they walked away from that. And of course, we were going, we were fuming. That was, I mean, that was because of agents. Yeah, that was of because agents, of agents. Right? Yeah. So, and, you know, so he walked away from it. You know, people wanted extra money. He walked away from it. He's done that many times before. To our frustration, by the way, he's done it many times before. But morally, we never questioned him because that was how he was. So now we have a new regime, and they are much more agent-driven, and they are they are swimming with the sharks, right? They are swimming with the sharks, and we got the Pepe deal over the line now. And then you hear about this now. It seems to be, you know, if we believe what's written, it seems to be a, a, an arson investigation, and, and I'm quite pleased to see it. Do you because- think? Um, sorry, just uh, t- sorry to cut across. Do you think it is in some way connected to? The appointment that that KSE made a few weeks back of a, a lawyer called Tim Lewis, a non, he's been appointed as a non-executive director to the boards of Arsenal Holdings and Arsenal Football Club. Um, it, it seems coincidental, I guess, that after his appointment, um, things are being looked at and investigations are taking place. You know, we've spoken before, Andrew, and we've, um, I've said the words, I've, I've always been concerned that Arsenal are vulnerable to opportunists, mm-hmm. right? So, been pointing your fingers, just just had a feeling, you know, the prices, I, I, that you can look at the prices of the deals, players staying too long, players rolling to the last year, they feel the environment allows them to, you know, take advantage of our desperation to get back to the top table, and I think we, maybe we've been taken advantage of in the past. I'm glad to see somebody who seems to be put on the board to provide some form of oversight. I think that's very important. Again, we've grown up with a single point of failure, the man who was, who was morally beyond reproach. We didn't need oversight. We didn't need any of that. He did all of that for us. Now we have a much more layered organization, which I've always wanted, by the way. I did not want a single person being... The, the only thing that mattered. I wanted layers in the club. I wanted the club to develop. I wanted us to have a structure that was more sustainable. If one person moves out, you just feel refill that person. You can move forward and grow and be better. So I've always wanted this. But when when you have a a power shift and a change, there needs to be oversight. There needs to be a, mm. you're giving a new set of people that you have no track record with a lot of trust, and these are custodians of our club. And if you're the owner, you want somebody there that's there for you yeah. to make sure that the spend is efficient, that everything's done in a proper way. And we shouldn't be scared of that. Every organization, big organization, has to go through internal and external audits, for example. They have to have this governance in place. We're a big organization now. We can't be run without the right set of governance in place. And yeah. I think it's a really good point you've made there. Maybe this is part of us looking at ourselves to make ourselves better. I'm not against it. I really am not against it. Mm. I'm not against a lot of the things that have happened. We are clunky in our communication. That's for sure. We absolutely are. We are out there at the moment in the airwaves. But we are we are looking at ourselves. And that needs to happen. We can't pretend. We can't walk around saying we are the arsehole. Everything will be okay. Yeah. You know, we've got to make it happen. We've got to make change. We've got to make ourselves more efficient, make ourselves better, be elite, and then we'll get more elite players wanting to be in our in our club. Isn't football a really weird industry in the sense that people can find themselves in jobs um, as a matter of happenstance, almost? Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, of Raul Sanyehi here in the sense that I'm not being critical of him or anything like that, but but just the the processes that 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 take place, um, it's quite interesting that Sanyehi's name is not mentioned or is it's conspicuous by its absence. I think from that ESPN report, but you know he was brought in by Ivan Gazidis. KSE had a lot of faith in Ivan Gazidis. Um, whether you agreed with that or not, uh, you know that's that's your own opinion. But they certainly did. They thought he was uh, a smart guy. So when they brought in Raul. 
you know, they trusted Ivan when he said, Raul, you know, is the right guy. And all of a sudden, you know, having been brought in as somebody who's going to be our director of football operations, he is the most senior football guy at a club like Arsenal, a big organization, a big business, as you've said, and as everybody understands. But but the process to get that job, like, how do you how do you marry that with what a, a big business or a big company would do ordinarily in the sense that they would probably interview a number of people rigorously and hire the best possible candidate? Whereas it just seems in football, and it's not just about Sanyehi or Arsenal, that a lot of people sort of slide into jobs in in a weird way, um, without that sort of, um, without that rigor or without that 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 HR process. Basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you know, the, where if you or I were to go for a very important job, we'd have to convince people that we were the right guy for the job, not just the right guy in the right place at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've been for jobs. I've had, I had 12 interviews, one job I went for Jesus. and got in the end. And uh, I say that and people are surprised, but I mean, that's not surprising at all to me. That's the way the, big, the business world works, right? You've got to be seen by many different people and people have to sign off on that decision. And I think, again, I keep coming back to old culture versus new culture. In the old culture, yeah, we'll just get somebody in who's got a good track record. We get them in. I'm, I'm, I'm maybe being a bit glib there. Yeah, yeah. It just feel like that. It feels like that, you know, on the words, on the, having a chat with somebody. I mean, I listened to Harry Redknapp talking about Frank Lampard getting his job at Derby when he spoke to the Derby chairman and said, you should give me an interview. He's really quite good. He goes for an interview, does well, gets a job. Mm. What, what, what happened? What, what, is that how it works? And then he ends up a year later, he's at Chelsea, gets a job. And then people complain about how these roles are made public, how they're advertised. Is it fair to, you know, how, you know, is opportunities being given for many people to apply for them? Is that the best possible person? Football is growing up. Mm. It is growing up. We ask questions how we're behaving. We have to. This can't continue job for the boys. I'm not saying that's what happened with Raul, but I'm talking more general perspective. When things go well, no one says anything. When things don't quite go so well, and when you see things potentially like this deal, although he's not linked to it, but you know there is there's an inevitable link if you're the head of football. You know, there's an mm. inevitable link, whether it be soft or direct. You've got to be good. You've got to be clear. You've got to be transparent. You've got to be efficient. Otherwise, people will question how you arrived in that role and they'll question your track record. And that's how it should be when you're on a, a top exec at a top club. Mm. You need to be challenged. You need to be challenged. And I'm really pleased to see this. I don't know how it's happened. I don't know how it's happened, but it needs to happen because I want to get to a point, Andrew, and I'm sure you do too. I'm sure all your listeners do, where we trust this club completely. Mm. And, and we're adjusting to this change. And it's not easy for all of us. Right? We question it. And it gets questioned by the media. But I want to turn around and say, I know why these guys are here. I know what their motivations are. I know what they're trying to achieve. There's a common goal, a common group of people. I sense between Edu and Arteta there's an alignment. On the new player today, there's an alignment. They're interviewing. They're talking about each other. They feel more comfortable with each other. That's my feeling from what I've been given. Now I want to make sure that everything around them is really appropriate. Mm. Right. Just very finally, bringing it back to the uh, the forward line and, and what we might do, assuming that, uh, you know, Willian is going to play a part in that as well. Um, w- what do you think is going to happen with, with Alexandra Lacazette? Um, the market might dictate our decision in that to a certain extent if there aren't any offers that we consider good enough but 29 years of age he's he's got two years left on his deal which is where we said we were going to make decisions on players um and and rightly so that is the way to do it uh if he goes or if we sell him do you see a striker coming in or is um is what we've got sufficient to offset his departure because um you know, he is an experienced player. He is a goal scorer, if not quite as prolific as uh, some people would like. But, you know, and it has been an important part of Mikel Arteta's team in the last few weeks as well. Um, you know, I can see why or how we might move Aubameyang centrally, uh, depending on what we yeah. do in this market. And and I wonder if that has been part of the the discussions and part of the the 
the decision that he might make in terms of his future and the final years of his playing career because that's what it's going to be at Arsenal if he stays for another two or three years. So, you know, yeah. what he wants as a player has got to be a, a consideration there. Um, so what's your take on on what might happen with Lacazette and what would you do personally if, if you had that decision to make? If it was me, I would look for a, a sell a market for him I, I definitely would uh, there seems to be rumours of, of our flag her and Juventus a, a number that to me doesn't look too bad so I would do it and and I would definitely think about um, underpinning Aubameyang so you've got a 31 year old and a 28, 29 year old can you do both I'm not so sure you should I would look for a a, a striker, a, a, a wing forward type striker. Mm. You know, I do, I do like the boy at uh, Celtic, uh, Edward. Mm. I do like Marcus Turam. Now, both those players can play off the left and they can play centre forward. So when we don't play Aubameyang, we still have a physical presence, a physical tone pole that can lead our line. Because Aubameyang, he, eventually he will get a little injury. You know, he's been unbelievable, his consistency and his availability. Yeah. But it, it won't last forever. And then we are really looking at, you know, we're looking at Eddie and we're looking at youngsters who shouldn't really be carrying the burden of carrying Arsenal's front line over an elongated period of time. Martelli's not back till January and then he's going to have to get up to speed and he's only 18, 19. Yeah. So we do need that bridge, that 22, 23 year old player that's going to be the next Arsenal centre forward in a couple of years' time that's going to carry our hopes and dreams. And now's the time to get him. And you do that by getting a, a, a flexible forward that can develop into a key goal scorer, but he's got time to develop. I and mean, you're moving on a player that's done well for us, got good numbers. But you know what? We need to do some rebuilding there and do some upgrading. And that's how football is. Don't be afraid of the churn. Just take it. Yep. It's there. Take it. Move forward. And and I really hope we do. Nothing against the player. I like the player. But I really hope we do. And that's how you invest in your superstars. You underpin them. You put them into areas. I don't want to see a bang young running back covering left backs anymore. No. Don't. Want, it's just a waste of effort, a waste of time. Let's save his energy to be running into the um, opposition's box. Yeah. And I hope we do that. Yeah, I mean, we've got to protect uh, a guy that we're going to give £300,000 a week to. That's the reality. And, you know, we have to take into account his age at 31. Uh, you know, he's had a fairly long career. But we do have to be mindful of, of how we use him. And you're absolutely right. I think get the getting the best out of him is playing him in a position where he is not tasked with protecting left backs or, or uh, running up and down the wing, which isn't to say he can't do it. But I think you probably get more out of him in the long term if you don't drain those batteries uh, week in, week out, uh, asking him to do that kind of job. But look, it's going to be a fascinating window. There's a lot to do and a lot to get right, and hopefully they will do that. It might take more than one window to get us to where we want to get to. But with Mikel Arteta at the helm, uh, I think people are feeling a bit more confident about where we might go and what we might do and how we might get there with the kind of players that he's looking for. So uh, I think the window closes October sixth we'll no doubt talk about transfers again but as ever uh, great to have you on clive really appreciate it it's uh, it's a pleasure anytime mate thanks a lot thank you very much indeed to clive you can find him on twitter at clive pafc at clive pafc and of course on the arsenal vision podcast which you can find at arsenalvisionpodcast.com and wherever you get your podcasts i do recommend it Right, I am going to leave it there. Minimal waffle on this particular podcast. I just wanted to get something out for you guys to listen to over the weekend. James and I will be here on Monday with an Arscast Extra. Who knows what we might be discussing then. Obviously, Willian has dropped today, so that'll be a thing. And maybe we might get some good news on the Aubameyang situation. Who knows? But we will cover that on Monday, as we always do. I just want to take a moment to thank you all so much for your support, to thank you for being being here for subscribing for listening reading and everything else that you do uh that's it just really really thank you um i don't know what else to say other than have yourselves a fantastic weekend whatever you're doing have a great one uh james and i'll be here on monday so until the next one take it easy folks cheers bye-bye <laughs>